بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلي وسلم على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وقرة اعيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه افضل الصلاه واتم التسليم اما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في قرانه العزيز بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون وقال تعالى ايضا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما We commence by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is no doubt our creator, sustainer, nourisher, protector and cure. We ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his choicest of blessings and salutations upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, his family members, his companions and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of Qiyamah. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, First and foremost, I advise myself and then all of you all present here to adopt a life of taqwa. And that is to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be conscious of Him during every single second of our lives. If we wish to attain success in this world as well as the hereafter, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all from the people of taqwa. And may He azza wa jal make us from the victorious and successful ones. Ameen. The topic for today's khutbah is inshallah ta'ala life is like riding a bicycle let me repeat it again life is like riding a bicycle and the aspect that i hope to focus on will be inshallah ta'ala balance and taking a path of moderation our maker subhanahu wa ta'ala he states in the noble quran وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا and thus we have made you a just and balanced nation لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ so that you may be a witness over mankind وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا and so that the messenger may be a witness over you all so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly states in the Noble Qur'an that He has made us or created us as a just and balanced nation Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi rahimahullah, he mentions in regard to the tafsir of this particular ayah that being balanced, listen to me attentively, this is you know profound words by Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi rahimahullah. Being balanced in reality is the furthest point between two extremes. In a spectrum you have two extremes and being balanced is the furthest point between the two extremes. So it's right in the middle. There is no doubt that the two poles of excess and extravagance are destruction. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. The two extremes are no doubt destruction. As Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi rahimahullah puts it in his tafsir in regard to the particular ayah that I just read. We have a hadith that has been recorded in the book of Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim rahimahullah. rahimahumallah. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As radiallahu an. He reports, and the narration goes along the lines of these words, that news went to the Prophet wasallam that he, Abdullah an, used to fast consecutively. He used to fast almost every single day, and he used to spend the nights in prayer, in the sense, 
In the mornings he used to be fasting every single day in a consecutive fashion. And in the nights he used to spend the nights in salah, in prayer. News went to the Prophet wasallam and Rasulullah wasallam. The beautiful teacher, the beautiful role model, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Please remember salawat and I mention his beautiful name. He educated Abdullah radiallahu an by telling him, Ya Abdullah, Ya Abdullah, I hear that you are, once again the narration goes along the lines of these words, alayhi salatu wasalam, that O oh, Abdullah, I hear that you fast consecutively. I hear that you spend the nights in prayer. Don't do that, rather fast, alternate and fast, and also in the sense fast and then break your fast, and then get up for prayer and then take some sleep as well. Because if you do not do that, your eyes will become tired, your body will become tired, and gradually you will fall sick. And then he said, Allahu alayhi wa sallam went on to pinpoint something extremely important. He went on to say that your eyes have a right over you. Your eyes have a haq over you that you need to fulfill in regard to your eyes. Your body has a right over you that you need to fulfill. Your wife has a right over you that you need to fulfill. Allahu Akbar. Amazing. Deep words of the Prophet wasallam. And then he went on to teach him, Ya Abdullah, it would suffice for you to fast three days a month. Three days a month. Why? Because each good deed of yours is multiplied tenfold. Is multiplied tenfold. So if you fast three days a month, that would equate you fasting the entire month. And if you were to fast three days every single month throughout the year, you end up reaping the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, equivalent to fasting the entire year. Allahu Akbar. Look at how balanced and beautiful our religion Islam is. And look at the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Amazing teachings. You, in the sense, your body has a right over you. Your eyes have a right over you. In the sense, you need to give your eyes some rest. You need to give your body some rest. Your wife has a right over you. You need to spend time with your wife. You need to have intimate moments with your wife. You need to fulfill the sexual pleasures of your wife. Your wife has a right over you. In the sense, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with a spouse, then you have certain rights that you need to fulfill in regard to your spouse, in regard to your marital bond. Allahu Akbar. Our religion is so beautiful and so balanced that if you were to anal analyze Islam with other religions, like say for example Christianity and Judaism, now it has been distorted, but now the way they look at talaq, for example, divorce, Christians actually find it very difficult to avail of a divorce. I mean, it's not very easy. They have to struggle a lot in terms of availing of a divorce. Likewise, in terms of the Yahud, the followers of Judaism, Jews, for them, if they were to pronounce divorce, I mean, if divorce were to take place between two spouses, then there is no getting back together. There is no getting back together. In the sense, if they were to have second thoughts after pronouncing the divorce or after the divorce is enacted, there's no way for them to get back together. But on the other hand, when we look at the teachings of Islam, Islam teaches us that divorce is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed for us as a last resort, a good uh, resort, a good an analogy in regard to divorce is that it is like a fire escape to a house. In the sense, it's not something that we resort to at the very outset of a problem. But instead, like say for example in a house, you don't generally take the fire escape to access your house. You would generally access your house through the front door. But say a tragedy, a huge fire, something tragic takes place in the house, then obviously you would resort to the fire escape to get yourself safely out of the house. Likewise, if two spouses were to enter into a marriage, they're supposed to invest as much as possible into that marriage to protect that marriage because at the end of the day, it is a boon. It is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I've mentioned this in the past as well. Every blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has rights that we need to fulfill. Every blessing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made you a wealthy person. You're being blessed with wealth then it is upon you not to squander that wealth away. It is not upon you to waste that wealth. Why? Because it is a huge blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are supposed to spend that wealth in a wise manner to secure a good life in this world as well as the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with the best in this world and the hereafter. Ameen. So divorce is not entirely a bad thing. Some people look at divorce as something taboo. We're not supposed to talk about divorce. We're not supposed to resort to divorce. You know, if two spouses are fighting like cats and dogs, it doesn't matter. They have to live for the children. They have to live for the world. They're not supposed to resort to divorce. 
That's not what Islam teaches. Islam teaches us to take a path of moderation. Islam teaches us to be balanced and just. If two spouses are not compatible for one another, if two spouses are not compatible for one another, they're striving, they're struggling because we, of course, as counselors, we generally advise people to strive to invest as much as possible into their marriage and not to resort to divorce immediately. But say they've strove really hard, they've invested as much as possible into their marital relationship, but they're still finding it very difficult to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Or they're finding it very difficult, the two spouses are finding it difficult to agree on certain things, then Islam has placed divorce as a resort for them to part ways and go their own ways and live their lives. This is Islam, a balanced and beautiful religion. Moving on, I would like to mention a beautiful quote by um, Imam Wahab ibn Munabbih rahimahullah. He mentions, listen to me attentively, that verily everything has two ends. Everything has two poles or rather every matter has two ends and every matter has two poles. And a middle, you have two poles, two extremes and a middle. And he says, if you hold on to one of the ends, if you hold on to one of the poles, the other will be skewed in the sense if you hold on to one pole in the sense, like say, for example, take it like a, a plank. If you were to move to one extreme, the other side of the plank would come up. So what he's saying is that you're not supposed to hold on to either one of the two extremes. He says, if you hold the middle instead, the two ends will be balanced. In the sense, if you stand right in the middle of a plank, then the two ends will be balanced. And then he goes on to cap the quote off by saying, you must seek the middle ground in all matters and all things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open the doors of understanding for all of us. Ameen. So my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, this principle of moderation, this is a beautiful and extremely important principle. This principle of balance, this principle of moderation should be pervasive in our daily thinking, in our, you know, in, in all of our thinking, in our thought processes, we must give priority to this principle of moderation, this principle of balance. And it must be at the forefront of our reasoning in daily life. In regard to religious matters as well as worldly matters, we should be moderate when it comes to balancing the duties of deen, of the religion, as well as duties of the worldly life. Don't go to any one of the two extremes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Noble Quran. وَابْتَغِ فِي مَا آتَاكَ اللَّهُ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Allah Azza wa Jal, He states, Seek the home of the hereafter. وَابْتَغِ فِي مَا آتَاكَ اللَّهُ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ Seek the home of the hereafter by that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. And then our Maker Azza wa Jal states, وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا But do not forget your share of this world. Look at the balance. Seek your home of the hereafter with that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. If Allah Azza wa Jal has given you wealth, like I said earlier, secure a good life in this world as well as the hereafter. You need to secure your home in the hereafter because that's where you're going to live forever and ever. We're going to live there for infinity, forever and ever. So that's where our priorities need to be. We don't, we shouldn't ever get our priorities mixed up. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to mention, وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا At the same time, do not forget your share of this worldly life. Do not forget your share of this worldly life. And this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, our beloved Prophet, has highlighted in many a place. We have a narration that has been recorded in the book of Imam Muslim, rahimahullah. Hamdala radiyallahu an, he states, that, and the narration goes along the lines of these words, that whenever we used to be with the Prophet ﷺ, we used to be reminded of paradise. We used to be reminded of Jahannam. We used to be reminded of all these things, of the, admon of the admonishments of the Prophet ﷺ, of the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. Because you need to clearly understand, my dear brothers in Islam, that the Sahaba, Ridwan Ta'ala, Ali Majma'een, they loved the Prophet ﷺ immensely, immensely. Hamdala radiallahu anhu, he loved the Prophet ﷺ so much, and that's why this concern arose. And that's why he went to the Prophet ﷺ with this concern of his. 
He states, that, Ya Rasulullah, when we are with you, we are reminded of paradise. We are reminded of Jahannam. We are reminded of the torments of Jah Jahannam. We are reminded of the bliss and pleasures of Jannah. We are reminded of your admonishments, of your teachings. But the minute we go home, and the minute we become busy with our children, the minute we become busy with our wives, our families, our businesses, our trade, we tend to let all of these things slip away from us. Why, Ya Rasulullah? Like I said, they loved the Prophet so much. Some of the Sahaba, many brothers in Islam, at times they would be seated at home, they would remember the Prophet they would run just to see the Prophet Not to do anything else, just to get a glimpse of the Prophet Ibn Umar radiallahu an, a famous companion of the Prophet وسلم, the son of Umar al-Farooq after the demise of the Prophet وسلم, he would get on top of his mount on his horse and he would ride around Medina and you know what he would say oh let the hooves of my animal touch the hooves of the, the animal of the Prophet this was the love that Ibn Umar عنه, had for the Prophet once he was traveling with a companion of his Ibn Umar عنه, in the middle of nowhere they were, they were passing by a particular location, a location where there weren't any trees, nothing, a deserted location. Suddenly, Ibn Umar radiallahu anh, he bends down. In the sense, he was riding his mount, he bends as if, as if he was ducking from something. His companion asked him, Ya Ibn Umar, I saw you suddenly duck, but there wasn't anything for you to duck. Why did you duck? He then went on to tell him, once I was traveling with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and at that time, there was this old tree and there was an overhanging dry branch. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at this particular juncture, he ducked to avoid the branch and now I am ducking to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Amazing. Look at how observant he was. A young companion. He observed the fact that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ducked at that point and he was ducking to follow in the footsteps of his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's another incident I keep recalling this. This was during the... Battle of Badr, and as you all know, the Battle of Badr was a decisive victory for the Muslims, but initially, it was actually a very crucial stage, because as you all know, the numbers were not in the favor of the Muslimun. The Muslimun were just 300 odd in number, whilst the pagans of Mecca, they numbered almost a thousand, and they were armed to the teeth. They had weaponry, they had horses, they had steeds, they had camels. Whilst the Muslimun, they didn't have much and they were few in number. Nonetheless, it was the point where the two armies were about to face in battle and Rasulullah was straightening the rows as this was the practice of the Prophet He taught the companions discipline. He was the best leader, the best role model. So he was straightening the rows and at this crucial juncture, there was a Sahabi, a companion by the name Sawad ibn Ghazia radiallahu anh. He observes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam making his way, straightening the rows. Sawad ibn Ghazia radiallahu anh immediately plans something. And as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was making his way to where Sawad radiallahu anh was standing, Sawad radiallahu anh intentionally stood in such a way that his chest was protruding and he was not in alignment with the row. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who had very keen, sharp eyesight, he observed Sawad radiallahu anh, and he made his way to Sawad radiallahu anh. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had a stick with him at that time. He lightly tapped Sawad radiallahu anhu on his chest, on his upper body, chest and abdomen. And he said, Ya Sawad, istawu, istawu, straighten your row, straighten your row, stand in alignment with the others. My dear brothers in Islam, no sooner the stick touched the body of Sawad radiallahu anh, he cried out, Ya Rasulullah, you have hurt me and I want to take retaliation now. The Sahaba, Ridwan ta'ala, Ali Majma'een, who were around at that time, they were surprised, they were baffled. They were wondering, what's wrong with Sawad? What is he doing? And what is he saying? Retaliation from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what's wrong with Sawad? Has he lost his mind? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was calm. He did not lose his cool. Because after all, he was just, he was fair, he was balanced. He was an individual who took the path of moderation. And he was someone who practiced what he preached. He looked at Sawad radiallahu anhu and said, Ya Sawad, if that's what you want, here you are. And he gives the stick to him and says, go ahead. Go ahead and take your retaliation. 
Sawad radiallahu an calmly looks at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and says, Ya Rasulullah, as you can see, I'm bare-bodied. Because at that time he was bare-bodied. He did not have any clothing in terms of his upper body. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had donned an armor at that time. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, if it is to be fair, if the retaliation and retribution is to be fair, then you need to shed your upper garment. In the sense, you need to remove your armor so that the retribution and the retaliation can be fair. The Sahaba, Ridwan Lai Ta'ala, Ali Majma'een, they were enraged. Just think of the situation. Put yourselves in the shoes of the Sahaba. They were upset. They didn't know what was going on. What's wrong with Sawad? Why is he saying all of this? And that too at such a crucial juncture. We are outnumbered. We are about to go into battle. And what is Sawad talking about? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam very calmly shed the armor that he was wearing and said, Go ahead, Ya Sawad. Go ahead, Ya Sawad. No sooner... The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam shed his armor. My dear brothers in Islam, Sawad radiallahu anhu let the stick fall. And he ran to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He hugged Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And he started to kiss the chest and the stomach of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, this is what I wanted, Ya Rasulullah, this is what I wanted. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam was observing all of this. He asked, Ya Sawad, Ya Sawad. Why did you do this? Why did you do this? And then Sawad radiallahu anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, I observed that this is a crucial juncture. We are about to go into battle. And as you know, and we all know, our numbers, we are outnumbered. In the sense, we are very few in number. And I don't know whether I will come back from this battle alive. And I wanted my lips to touch your skin the last. In the sense, in the sense your skin... I wanted your skin to be the last thing that I ever touched. Allahu Akbar. Look at the love that the Sahaba Ridwan Lai Ta'ala alayhi majma'in had for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So my dear brothers in Islam, coming back to the hadith of Hamdullah radiallahu an, Hamdullah radiallahu an said, said this to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, why? Why do I feel that when I go back to my family, when I go back to my children, when I go back to my business, my trade, these things start to slip away from my mind in the sense the, the description of Jannah, the description of Jahannam, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, my mind tends to focus on other things. You know what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said? He said, Ya Hanbala, by the hand, by the one in whose hand is my soul, listen to me attentively, by the one in whose hand is my soul, if you were to remain in the same mindset as you generally are when you are with me, if you were to remain in that same mindset throughout the day, in the sense if you were to always be reminded about Jannah, if you were to always be reminded about Jahannam, and if you were to be in that mindset throughout the day, the angels would descend and the angels would shake hands with you whilst you walk down the streets and they will also come and greet you whilst you sleep. If you were to remain in that mi mindset throughout the day, the angels would greet you. They would shake hands with you whilst you walk down the streets. They would shake hands with you whilst you sleep. But instead, ya hamdala, there is a time for that and there is a time for this. There is a time for that, there is a time for this. Look at the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. Balanced and beautiful, moderate teachings. So my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, let us, let us be steadfast on the path of moderation. Let us be balanced in terms of how we look at things, how we you know, carry ourselves. Let us, let us leave the extremes and let us secure that middle ground that the scholars that I just mentioned were highlighting. Let us take on that middle ground. Let us make sure that we don't go to the extremes because like Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi rahimahullah mentioned, the two extremes lead to nothing but destruction. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. Let us be balanced and let us focus. Let us fixate our focus towards Al-Akhirah. At the same time, don't forget about your share of this world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with a very good life in this world and a very good life in the hereafter. The very best in this world as well as the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us of our sins. May He accept our good deeds and just as how He unites us here in this beautiful masjid. May He unite us in the gardens of Jannah with our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Ameen wa akhir da'wayan. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.